Chapter 2 Philosophy of Non-Dualism The Spirit of Shankara's Philosophy Brahman, the absolute existence, knowledge and bliss, is real. The universe is not real. Brahman and Atman, man's inner self, are one. In these words, Shankara sums up his philosophy. What are the implications of this statement? What does he mean by real and by not real? Shankara only accepts accepts as real that which neither changes nor ceases to exist. In making this definition, he follows the teachings of the Upanishads and of Gaudapada, his predecessor. No object, no kind of knowledge can be absolutely real if, it is, if its existence is only temporary. Absolute reality implies permanent existence. If we consider our various experiences during the states of waking and dreaming, we find that dream experiences are contradicted by waking experiences and vice versa, and that both kinds of experience seize in dreamless sleep. In other words, every object of knowledge, external or internal, for thought or idea, is as much an object of knowledge as is the external world, is subject to modification and therefore, by Shankara's definition, not real. What, then, is the reality behind all our experiences? There is only one thing that never leaves us, the deep consciousness. This alone is a constant feature of all experience. And this consciousness is the real, absolute self. In dreamless sleep, also, the real self is present as a witness, while the ego sense, which we call our self, our individuality, has become temporarily merged in ignorance, ignorance, avidya, and disappeared. Vedanta philosophy occupies a central position between realism and idealism. Western realism and idealism are both based on a distinction between mind and matter. Indian philosophy puts mind and matter in the same category. Both are objects of knowledge. Shankara should not, however, be regarded as a precursor of Berkeley. He does not say that the world is unreal simply because its existence depends upon our perception. The world, according to Shankara, is and is not. Its fundamental unreality can only be uh, understood in reference to the ultimate mystical experience, the experience of an illumined soul. When the illumined soul passes into transcendental consciousness, he realizes the self, the Atman, as pure bliss and pure intelligence, the one without a second. In this state of consciousness, all perception of multiplicity ceases. There is no longer any sense of mine and thine. The world as we ordinarily know it has vanished. Then the self shines forth as the one, the truth, the Brahman, the basis of this world appearance. World appearance, as it is experienced in the waking state, may be likened, says Shankara, to an imagined snake with proofs on closer inspection to be nothing but a coil of rope. When the truth is known, we are no longer deluded by the appearance. The snake appearance vanishes into the reality of the rope. The world vanishes into Brahman. Other systems of Hindu philosophy, Sankhya, Yoga, or Nyaya, maintain that the phenomenal world possesses an objective reality, even though it may not be apparent to the eyes of an illumined soul. Advaita Vedanta differs from them on this vital point. It denies the ultimate reality of the world of thought and matter. Mind and matter, finite objects and their relations, are a misreading of Brahman and nothing more. That is what Shankara teaches. The Nature of World Appearance When Shankara says that the world of thought and matter is not real, he does not mean that it is non-existent. The world appearance is and is not. In the state of ignorance, our everyday consciousness, it is experienced, and it exists as it appears. In the state of illumination, it is not experienced, and it ceases to exist. Shankara does not regard any experience as non-existent as long as it is experienced, but he very naturally draws a distinction between the private illusions of the individual and the universal or world illusion. The former he calls prativasika, illusory, and the latter, via Vaharika, phenomenal. For example, a man's dreams are his private illusions. When he wakes, they seize. But the universal illusion, the illusion of world phenomena, continues throughout a man's whole waking life unless he becomes aware of the truth 
through knowledge of Brahman. Shankara makes, also, a further distinction between these two kinds of illusion and those ideas which are altogether unreal and imaginary, which represent a total imp impossibility or a flat contradiction in terms, such as the son of a barren woman. Here, then, we are confronted by a paradox. The world is and is not. It is neither real nor non-existent, and yet this apparent paradox is simply a statement of fact, a fact which Shankara calls Maya. This Maya, this world appearance, has its basis in Brahman, the eternal. The concept of Maya applies only to the phenomenal world, which, according to Shankara, consists of names and forms. It is not non-existent, yet it differs from the reality, the Brahman, upon which it disappears in the light of knowledge of its external basis. World, apparent, world appearance is Maya, the self, the Atman, alone is real. Superimposition or Maya the most difficult of all philosophical problems is the relation between the finite and the infinite. The problem of how this finite world came into being, if we believe that the finite has an absolute reality of its own and that it has emerged from the infinite and is an actual transformation of the infinite, or if we regard the infinite as a transcendental first cause of the phenomenal world, a position held by most Christian theologians, then we must admit that the infinite is infinite no longer. A god who transforms himself into the visible universe is himself sub subject to transformation and change. He cannot be regarded as the absolute reality. A god who creates a world limits himself by the very act of creation and thus ceases to be infinite. The question, why should God create at all, remains unanswered. This difficulty is overcome, however, if we consider the world as Maya. And this explanation of our universe is, moreover, in perfect accord with the findings of modern science, which may be summarized as follows. A soap bubble with, irregu with irregularities and, caru and carugations on its surface is perhaps the best re representation of the new universe revealed to us by the theory of relativity. The universe is not the interior of the soap bubble, but its surface, and the substance out of which this bubble is blown, the soap film, is empty space welded into empty time. That it, thus, it is only when we analyze the nature of the universe and discover it to be Maya, neither absolutely real nor absolutely non-existent, that we learn how the phenomenal surface of the soap bubble safeguards the eternal presence of the absolute. The Upanishads, it is true, appear to consider Brahman as the first cause of the universe, both material and efficient. They declare that the universe emanates from, subsists in, and finally merges into the absolute Brahman. Shankara never directly contradicts the Upanishads, but he explains such statements in a different way. The universe, he says, is a superimposition upon Brahman. Brahman remains eternally infinite and unchanged. It is not transformed into his universe, it simply appears as this universe to us in our ignorance. We superimpose the apparent world upon Brahman, just as we sometimes superimpose a snake upon a coil of rope. This theory of superimposition, Vivartavada, is inseparably linked with the theory of causality. Causal relation exists in the world of multiplicity, which is Maya. Within Maya, the mind cannot function without causal relation. But to speak of cause and effect with reference to the absolute is simply absurd. To seek to know what caused the world is to transcend the world. To seek to find the cause of Maya is to go beyond Maya. And when we do that, Maya vanishes, for the effect ceases to exist. How then can there be a cause of no a non-existent effect? In other words, the relation between Brahman and Maya is, by its very nature, unknowable and undefinable by any process of the human intellect. Maya, a statement of fact as well as a principle. Thus, according to Shankara, the world of thought and matter has a phenomenal or relative existence and is superimposed upon Brahman, the unique absolute reality. As long as we remain in ignorance, as long as we have not achieved transcendental consciousness, we shall continue to experience this apparent world which is the effect of superimposition. When transcendental consciousness is achieved, superimposition ceases, what is the nature of the superimposition? In the introduction to his commentary on the Brahma Sutras, Shankara tells us that superimposition is the apparent presentation to consciousness by the memory of something previously observed elsewhere. 
We see a snake, we remember it. Next day, we see a coil of rope, we remember it. Next day, we see a... Uh, uh, we superimpose the remembered snake upon it and thereby misunderstand its nature. <clears throat> Shankara foresees an objection to his theory and goes on to anticipate and answer it. We may challenge the theory of superimposition by pointing out that Brahman is not an object of perception. How can we superimpose a snake upon a rope which we do not perceive? How can we superimpose a world appearance upon a reality which is not apparent to our senses? For every man superimposes objects only upon such other objects as are placed before him, as, as come into contact with his sense organs. To this, Shankara answers, Brahman is not, we reply, non-objective in the absolute sense, for Brahman is the object of the ego idea. We know quite well by intuition that inner self must exist since the ego idea is a presentation of the self, nor is it an absolute rule that the objects can be superimposed only upon such other objects as are placed before us. For ignorant people superimpose a dark blue color upon the sky, which is not an object of sense perception. This statement needs some further explanation. Although Brahman is never apparent to our everyday sense perception, there is a manner in which we are aware of the reality, the inner self. Brahman, it has been said, is absolute existence, knowledge, and bliss. Only in transcendental consciousness can we know this fully. Yet Brahman is so um, partly apparent to our normal consciousness also. Brahman is existence, and we all know that we exist. In this sense, every one of us has an intuitive knowledge of the inner self the Atman or Brahman within the creature. The inner self, the reality, is never an object of sense perception. However, because in our ignorance we superimpose the idea of a private individuality, of being Miss, Mr. Sp uh, Mr. Smith or Mrs. Jones, upon, upon our awareness of existence, we are unable to understand the existence, that existence is not our private property, that it is universal and absolute. The inner self is therefore present in our normal consciousness as the object of the ego idea, a literal translation of Shankara's phrase. The superimposition of the ego idea upon existence is our first and most important act as human beings. The moment we have made the central act of superimposition, the moment we have said, I am I, I am private, I am separate, I am an individual, we have set up a kind of chain reaction which makes further superimposition inevitable. The claim to individuality for ourselves implies individuality everywhere. It automatically superimposes a multiple world of creatures and objects upon the one undivided reality, the existence which is Brahman. Ego idea and world appearance depend upon each other, lose the ego idea and transcendental consciousness, and the world appearance must necessarily vanish. When and how did this act of superimposition occur? Was it at our individual birth or in some previous life? Was there, an, was there a historical moment corresponding to the story of the fall of Adam at which the phenomenal world came into being as the result of the ego idea? The futility of such questions should be self-evident. We merely go round in a circle. What is this world appearance? Maya. What causes it? Our ignorance. What is this ignorance? Maya also. If there was and is... If there was and is and always will be one unchanging reality, how can we possibly assume that Maya began at some definite historical moment in time? We cannot. Therefore, we are forced to conclude, as Shankara does, that Maya, like Brahman, is without any beginning. Ignorance as the cause and world appearance as the effect have existed always and will always exist. They are like <clears throat> seed and tree. The coupling of the real and the unreal produced by our ignorance, is a process universally evident in our daily lives. Shankara says, It is obvious and needs no proof that the object which is the non-ego and the subject which is the ego idea, superimposed upon the self, are opposed to each other like light and darkness, <clears throat> and cannot be identified. Still less can their respective attributes be identified. Nevertheless, it is natural to man, because of his wrong knowledge, not to be able to distinguish between these distinct entities and their respective attributes. He superimposes upon each the nature and, and attributes of the other, coupling the real with the unreal and making use of such expressions as I am that, that is mine. 
Shankara is speaking here of two stages in the process of superimposition. First, the ego idea is superimposed upon the inner self, the existence reality. Then the ego idea, reaching outward, as it were, identifies itself with the body and the body's mental and physical attributes and actions. We say, as a matter of course, I am fat, I am tired, I am walking, I am sitting down, without ever stopping to consider what this I really is. We go further. We claim purely external objects and conditions for our own. We announce that I am Republican or that this house is mine. As superimpositions multiply, extraordinary statements become possible and normal, such as we sunk three submarines yesterday or I carry a good deal of insurance. We identify our ego more or less with every object in the universe. And all the while, the inner self looks on, utterly detached from these moods and, anti and antics, yet making them all possible by lending to the mind that light of consciousness without which Maya could not exist. That Maya is beginningless can also be shown if we return for a moment to the image of the rope and the snake. The superimposition of the snake upon the rope is only possible if we can remember what a snake looks like. A child who had never seen a snake could never superimpose it. How then is it possible for the newly born child to, super, to superimpose the snake world appearance upon the rope Brahman? We can only answer this question if we postulate a universal snake memory which is common to all, my, all mankind and has existed from a time without beginning. This snake memory is Maya. Maya, says Shankara, is not only universal but beginningless and endless. A distinction must, however, be made between Maya as a universal principle and ignorance, avidya, which is individual. Individual ignorance is beginningless, but it can end at any moment. It is lost when a man achieves spiritual illumination. Thus the world may vanish from the consciousness of an individual and yet continue to exist for the rest of mankind. In saying this, Shankara's philosophy differs essentially from the subjective idealism of the West.